start broadcasting. Okay, so here we go. This is the very first in our series of uh, Meet the Scholar webinars, which is something we wanted to do for quite a long time. And we have Claire Davy, who's very kindly offered to host this series for us. And Clapsoda has always been very keen to uh, keen to work with academic partners because we we believe strongly in the behavior change science. We want to help people change their drinking habits, and we know that there's a lot of good scientific evidence out there that will help people do exactly that. So we're really thrilled to have have this series now starting for 2021, and we have a very timely presentation today on COVID and drinking. So I will I will hand you over to Claire Davy who's a PhD student at the Canterbury Christchurch University, and she will tell you a little bit more about today's webinar. Thanks, yeah. So good afternoon. Welcome to today's first webinar in the Meet the Scholars series. Um, it's a very exciting opportunity for the academic community to share some of its groundbreaking, um, but off, hot off the press research in the fields of alcohol, sobriety and well-being. So we're very grateful to be joined by Dr. Abby Rose today. Um, an experimental psychologist at the University of Liverpool. I know that Abby is due to give you more comprehensive overview of her accomplished background um, and the projects that she's worked on, including some with some NHS trusts and independent funding bodies. Um, but I think it suffices to say that she has extensive experience in the field of women's and maternal alcohol use research. Um, and today, Abby's sharing the results of her most recent research which investigated how COVID-19 has impacted alcohol use in the UK. Um, she'll discuss some of the factors that have created differences in consumption between men and women's alcohol consumption and explore these in light of pre-pandemic trends of gender drinking. So um, as per the previous intro, I'm Claire Davy. I'm a PhD research student at Canterbury Christchurch University investigating themes of sobriety and identity. I'll be facilitating as your host today um, and furnishing Dr. Rose with all your questions. So please do send them in and as they spring to mind and we'll address them at the end. Um, I've had a sneaky peek at the presentation and it's jam packed with incredibly rich content um, that I'm sure will inspire us all to reflect on our own experiences. So. Um, Abby, over to you. Thanks, Claire, um, and thanks, Club Soda, for for inviting me to talk. I want to firstly apologise because literally within the last twenty minutes, the house next door has started drilling, and there's really loud drilling going on. So if you can hear that, then I'm really, really sorry, um, but there's not a lot I can do about it. So I'm going to start the talk, so hopefully you can see the screen. Um, I can't see any of the chat during the talk, um, so if you have any questions, then I'll be really happy to answer them at the end. So, yeah, I'm Abby Rose. I'm a senior lecturer. I work within the Department of Psychology at the University of Liverpool, and I'm a member of the addiction research team. So just a brief overview of the talk today. I'm going to give you um, a background on me, um, the research I do and why I do it. I always think it's a bit strange when you're being talked at by somebody that you don't know any, anything about, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background. I'm going to cover why we think that women drink from the available evidence and literature. And then I'm going to focus on ways in which COVID might have impacted our alcohol use and with a focus on whether there are any gender differences. And I'm gonna talk about some new research that we've just finished analyzing literally last week, um, ready for publication. And then I'm gonna give an overview of why COVID might have impacted women's drinking and what the potential longer term implications of that are. So my background, um, as Claire mentioned, I'm an experimental psychologist. I did my my PhD in experimental psychology from the University of Sussex and I've always been interested in alcohol use and understanding why people drink the way they drink. So for example my PhD was on something called alcohol priming which is when if you have an initial drink you can be motivated to drink more. So I was really interested in the phenomenon whereby people might go out um, with the intention of only having one maybe two drinks being very sensible, going home and not having a hangover the next day. But then when they go out and they have that initial drink, suddenly 
they find that they're really motivated to stay out and continue drinking and how that can lead into things like binge drinking and drinking more than we wanted. So that was what I focused my PhD on. And then after that, I had several postdocs um, and then lectureships at St George's University of London. And then I had a, um, I was a lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College. Then I decided that I had had enough of commuting and I moved to the University of Liverpool in 2010. And then I became a senior lecturer later on. And as an experimental psychologist, most of my work was laboratory based. So we have a bar lab at the University of Liverpool, which is a laboratory that's set up to look more like a, um, a pub. Uh, and I would manipulate certain individual factors and then see how that changed people's behavior and decision making around alcohol use. So that's what I was um, kind of interested in. And then in 2014 and 2015, I had my children. And I found that everything changed and I perhaps wasn't quite as interested as I initially was in the laboratory based research and I started to try and think about um, other research areas that might be interesting and that I might be able to develop further and surprisingly I realized that maternal alcohol use might be something that might be worth looking at. So as a new mother, like um, most new mothers, I found myself trying to meet new women, um, uh, make new friendships, something that I hadn't really done for, for a long time. And I found that a lot of the conversations that I was having with um, these new mums, at some point or another would bring out drinking. And there would be kind of like sly looks and kind of smiles to each other about wouldn't it be nice to have a drink. And I kind of wouldn't, I didn't know whether that was a real thing, whether mothers were actually using alcohol, um, perhaps as a means of coping or de-stressing, rewarding ourselves for getting through like another day, or whether women were using it almost as a, as a means to uh, kind of connect with people and build new friendships. So that was something I was interested in. The other thing I was really interested in was maternal mental health. So we know that um, kind of the prevalence rates of things like postnatal depression and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, seems to be increasing. And certainly in relation to things like birth trauma. So if we experience childbirth as traumatic, um, and then we might go on to develop things like post-traumatic stress disorder. And we know from other populations, so for example, war veterans who have experienced conflict, they're at risk of developing mental health problems such as PTSD. And following that, they are at risk of developing alcohol use problems. So I was interested in seeing whether that relationship also exists in maternal groups um, and honestly there's just very very little research out there so that's something that I'm in, interested in exploring further and as a development from that I'm really interested in the associations between maternal alcohol use and mother's well-being and what impact that has on the child's health and well-being. In a broader context I'm also really interested in just women and alcohol so I have two PhD students, um, one Jasmine who I've been working with for a couple of years, she's great, she's looking at the associations between menstrual cycle and drinking behaviour. So for example does drinking behaviour change um, across different phases of a woman's menstrual cycle or um, do we drink for different reasons depending on what phase of the cycle we're in and then Katie Shaw who's about to start on the 1st of February um, is going to be looking at women's experience of um, alcohol treatment and interventions. So a lot of the standard typical alcohol treatments out there have been developed around men and kind of like developed on the basis of data that's been collected a lot by men. Um, and we know that there are differences between the reasons why and the impact of drinking um, across gender. So we're going to see whether there are maybe ways in which we can improve alcohol intervention, that experience and alcohol treatment for women and then to make it more effective. And I'm also really interested in underage alcohol and substance use. So again, um, Nick is going to be doing a PhD, also starting on the 1st of February, looking at um, alcohol use and substance use in adolescence, looking at um, hospital admissions. So we're working with Older Hay Children's Hospital on this PhD. And trying to work out whether there are ways in which we can engage with younger people effectively to help reduce the harm associated with alcohol and substance use in younger people. 
So that's my background. Um, why is alcohol research important? So we know that each year the NHS um, spends around 3.5 billion every year um, dealing with alcohol misuse. Um, in terms of societal impact, in terms of financial cost, um, 21 million per year is spent on alcohol misuse problems, and that doesn't cover, you know, obviously all the individual, um, but personal psychological impact on the individual and their family. Importantly, women uh, tend to be more vulnerable to alcohol's negative effects than men. They tend to experience the harm associated with alcohol at lower drinking levels, and they also develop those harms um, earlier. So that's why there's, again, there's important um, gender research to do. Also, in both men and women, alcohol use can be uh, associated with a whole range of both physical and mental health harms. But as I said, women may be more vulnerable to experiencing those problems earlier on. Years and years ago, when we looked at, um, when we used to talk about and research cancer risk in terms of our health behaviours, the focus was often on smoking. Whereas now in the past, you know, it's been several years now, but there's been a growing focus on um, the risk associated with alcohol use and um, cancer. Uh, especially in terms of things like female specific, often females, um, traditionally female cancer such as breast cancer. Um, but there's, there's, there's lots of issues to kind of to focus on. The other thing that is important when we look at women's alcohol use is that although obviously our own drinking behaviour can have an effect on our physical and mental health, there seems to be some unique secondary harms more associated with women's alcohol use. So the most obvious is drinking during pregnancy. So prenatal alcohol use is the biggest preventable um, cause of birth defects and intellectual disabilities in children. Um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is kind of the most, um, <clears throat> most often cited and clearly researched effect of drinking during pregnancy. So fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is associated really with women who drink quite a lot of alcohol during pregnancy um, and it's linked with a whole host of very um, negative outcomes for the child. So exploitation, um, uh, care home, um, poor educational job attainment, increased criminal activity, increased behavioural problems and um, health problems as they, as they grow older. So because there's no, um, as I said, uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is associated with high levels of alcohol use, but you do see fetal um, uh, problems, fetal negative effects from drinking even moderately during pregnancy. And because there's no known safe limit for every single woman and every fetus, several years ago, the chief medical officer changed the guidelines and said actually during pregnancy women should um, abstain from all alcohol use. But we still have high rates of alcohol use um, within the UK during pregnancy. So depending on where you look um, for the information, around 41 to 75 percent of women drink at some point during their pregnancy. But it's important to note that this amount will include those women who have consumed alcohol prior to realising that they're pregnant. But still, um, that kind of that rate of drinking during pregnancy translates into the UK having one of the highest rates of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder in the world. So around 3.2% um, is the is the rate is the estimated rate within the UK. And because of that, and because of the seriousness of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, most of the research around this area focuses on alcohol exposure in pregnancy, so drinking during pregnancy. But the more we look at the evidence, the more we see that actually drinking throughout motherhood um, poses some significant risks. So both again to the mother, um, but also to the child. So maternal drinking, paternal drinking is obviously important um, and it's definitely worth researching, but there seems to be a unique risk between maternal drinking um, and child impact. So as maternal drinking increases, then we see an increased risk of a whole host of things such as um, hospitalisation, accidental poisoning in children, um, mental health problems as the child gets older and also an increased risk of the child developing alcohol use problems as they get older. So it's really worth kind of researching and trying to help with it. One thing I want to make really clear though is that um, there is an awful lot of stigma around alcohol use in certain populations and drinking during pregnancy and motherhood is one of them, um, which I am not 
supportive of in any way. I don't think anybody should be stigmatised for how they drink and their alcohol choices. But if harm um, may occur, either to the individual or somebody else, then I very much think that that individual should be given the support and help that they need in order to um, change their behaviour effectively and um, in a way that suits them. So in terms of why women drink, there are lots of factors and the ones that I'm going to talk about, um, we might find that uh, some of them, you might, you might find that some of them resonate with you, others don't, um, but this is just what the evidence kind of some of the highlights. So one are demographic. So we tend to drink more as we're getting older, especially the group with the 54 to 64 year old um, is the, for women, um, is when we tend to be drinking more. Uh, people with higher socioeconomic status, education attainment, tend to drink more. White ethnicity, smokers tend to drink more. And if you live in an area where there are more um, drinking outlets, pubs, um, restaurants, shops and things that sell alcohol, then we're more likely to drink, which makes sense. Marketing is something that is really important. So female targeted alcohol marketing in the past like five years or so has really taken off. If you've gone into a supermarket and seen all the sparkly pink drinks everywhere, the pre-made fruit cocktails and things, you know that these products are being targeted um, to women. There's also a real, um, there's a growing uh, market for lower alcohol um, products. So I'm not talking about the low product, which is zero, like 0.5%, but the kind of products around 2 3%, which may be slightly lower alcohol than traditional kind of beers and ciders. Um, they might be great for some people who want to reduce their drinking, but there are issues around, well, will people just drink more because they think they can? And there's a possibility that, these kind of lower drinks might be um, attractive to groups that perhaps would usually avoid alcohol altogether. So, for example, um, pregnant women. So there's some research going on um, into that at the moment. Um, I don't think I, I found this wine, so I'm, I'm just using this as an example. Um, this is the Mad Housewife wine where you could buy six mixed bottles and it's very much marketed at mothers who are stressed and they're stressed because they've got all the housework to do with the children and things like that. Now I don't think you can get that and that shows that there's, there is sometimes a backlash against this kind of very female um, centric marketing. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So other reasons why women drink, obviously to celebrate and to socialise, certainly in the UK when we think about going out and celebrating, we've done something that we're proud of, we've achieved something, we're going to have a party, often alcohol is involved, um, but there are real differences in how we perceive that drinking. So for example, when we think of women from higher socioeconomic status groups, you know, enjoying you know, a champagne and things like that, that's seen as quite a positive thing. Whereas actually when we think of women from perhaps lower socioeconomic groups drinking, that can be more stigmatized. So it's not an equal playing field dependent on where you're from and what your background is. Also, social norms are really, really important. So we tend to be exposed to this growing narrative online about alcohol use. We also tend to be friends with people who have similar beliefs to us, similar behaviours to us. So we tend to drink in similar ways to most of our friends. So if we happen to be somebody who drinks <clears throat> at increasing risk levels, um, some of our friends will as well. So we kind of have that feedback. We think, well, this is normal. This is what everybody does. And people can be quite surprised sometimes when you say, well, actually, you drink more than is kind of typical for your age range and, and things like that. So that's really important. But also social media can really, they can push a message around alcohol use, that alcohol can be empowering, that can help us feel like our old selves. So again, going back to maternal drinking, when we do research with mothers, um, it's not uncommon to hear mothers say, well, alcohol makes me feel like I used to, you know, I'm not just a mum, I can still go out and have fun. And alcohol is a part of that, it's, it's very important. Mental health is also really key. So we know that people with mental health problems may be at increased risk of developing alcohol use disorders, but at the same time, people with alcohol use disorders are at an increased risk of developing mental health problems. So there's a two-way um, relationship there. 
Some of that might come down to trauma. So when people experience a traumatic event or they go through something that is traumatic, they are at an increased risk of um, drinking as a result. And that risk seems to be more for women than for men. That might be to do with coping strategies. So um, there's a famous hypothesis called the self-medication hypothesis. And this is the idea that the reason why there is this relationship between mental health problems and alcohol is because some people use alcohol as a way to self-medicate those mental health symptoms. And again, women are much more likely than men to at least report that they use alcohol in that way, that they use alcohol to cope. So the reason why women drink these factors are not, um, they're, they're, they don't stand alone, they all interact with each other to have a, a, a kind of a, you know, a multifaceted effect on our, on our drinking behaviour. So in terms of COVID, um, in the UK, there are a few things that we can look at in terms of drinking. So just prior to lockdown, if we look at um, purchasing behaviour, we were spending a lot more on the four weeks prior to the March lockdown compared to the same period the year previously. So that indicates that we were stockpiling alcohol just like we were the pasta and toilet roll. Um, but then when we actually looked at alcohol consumption during the period up to July 2020 versus 2019, we actually didn't seem to be drinking as much. It was 1.3 billion litres compared to 2 billion. Um, there seem to be some differences in terms of what was being purchased, but I've seen various reports on this. So I've seen some reports that say wine and spirit sales increased, which is stereotypically um, what women drink, uh, whereas beer and cider were decreasing. But I've also seen reports actually where beer and cider sales were, were higher. So um, depending on where you look and for what period you look at, things seem to have changed. Alcohol Change UK have been collecting quite a lot of useful data um, on drinking behaviour. So we found that 23% um, of women compared to 20% of men have reported drinking more during lockdown, whereas 19%, but 26% of men reported that they were drinking less. The amount consumed every day and also the number of drinking days, so the frequency in which we were drinking were increasing and that increase was greatest for women. And also, we seem to be seeing both an increase and a decrease in alcohol use. That makes sense when you think about mental health issues because mental health um, populations show the same relationship. So if you have a mental health um, uh, disorder, you are more at risk of both increasing your alcohol use, but you're also more um, likely to decrease your alcohol use as well. So you see this split um, that we seem to be seeing with lockdown. And this table here just shows, this is from the Global Drug Survey, um, and this is not just UK, uh, but it shows kind of for men and for women and um, trans and non-binary um, respondents about how much they've been drinking and had the frequency of drinking. So overall, um, quite a few people say that the amount they've been drinking is quite fairly stable, but we are seeing in the green and the dark green that there is a significant portion, around a third of people are drinking more, and they certainly seem to be drinking more frequently. So then our survey, um, we released this in April last year because when everybody was going insane and worried about jobs and how we were going to you know, get everything ready for students and carry on research, I decided that it would be a great idea to do a, a new study. Um, basically, the, with the focus being on not just what we were drinking, but why we were drinking, the way we were during lockdown. So here is everyone involved in the study and a special shout out to Patsy, who was a PhD student, who has basically done all the data processing and all the analysis on this um, beast of a survey. So we sent out the survey, first of all, in April last year, and we asked people to give us their contact details at the end with the, um, with the explanation that we would send them a shorter survey every two weeks while lockdown was going on. And so we had about 540 participants take part um, who completed at least 90% of the survey, the baseline survey, so we could include them. And what you see at survey two, three, four, and five is that the number of participants taking part drop down. So you always get this dropout rate for surveys, but it's really important to look at what who is dropping out so you get a better understanding of what your like who you what kind of groups your data really applies to. So women were more likely to drop out than men. 
younger people were more likely to drop out. People who were living in larger households, which was defined as living with at least four people, were more likely to drop out than people who lived by themselves. Occupational status, so those who weren't affected by COVID were more likely to drop out of the survey than people who were affected by COVID. And also people with a higher audit score are more likely to drop out. So audit is the alcohol use disorders identification test. It's a clinical tool, but practically everyone in alcohol research uses it as well. So it gives kind of a measure of potential alcohol misuse problems and things. So people with higher levels of alcohol misuse are more likely to drop out. And again, that's pretty normal for this kind of research. So in terms of baseline audit was around seven. So that's kind of lower risk. Um, although we had around 30% of people who were um, hazardous drinkers and almost 10% of the respondents were harmful drinkers. Um, in the subsequent surveys, we used something called the Audit C, which is just a shorter audit. It's just four items, so it's quicker to administer. And what we found was that Audit score, Audit C score increased over time, increased as lockdown progressed, which was surprising because alcohol use was decreasing because most of the people who were drinking loads and loads at baseline were dropping out. Um, so we're still kind of working out how to interpret that finding. Participants with a bachelor's degree um, tended to drink more than people with um, A-level education. Those with higher incomes tended to drink more. And we also found that key workers were reporting drinking higher levels than non-key workers. This table shows us drinking at baseline, so this is how much people were drinking at the start of lockdown. But first of all, there was typically weekly units. So this was how much respondents um, reported they drank prior to lockdown, prior to COVID. So what we see here is that typically, um, so this is the media, so most men were drinking around 36 units, most women were drinking around 23 units. So that's hazardous to harmful drinking. Um, and there is a significant gender difference, so men are drinking more. Past weekly units is how much they were drinking at the start of lockdown. So men and women both increased their alcohol use and there's no longer a gender effect here. So um, that, that gender effect, that typical gender effect that men are drinking more than women seem to um, go away during lockdown. And usually audit score is higher in men than in women. So this, again, is for both men and women. So what we were interested in understanding was what factors were related to drinking more. And what we looked at, so these were all the various factors that we were measuring. And this is um, for the baseline assessment. So this is early lockdown. So during the first stage of lockdown, people who felt more unpleasant, they felt more negative and they felt more lonely, that was associated with higher levels of drinking. We had specific drinking motives, so for like coping with our feelings, social positives, so like celebrating motives, and social coping, like feeling pressurised to drink um, by other people. They were all significantly related to um, alcohol use, but personal coping seemed to be the one that was really pushing our drinking behaviour. And then we also had mental health, anxiety and depression, but we didn't find any relationship there with early drinking behaviour. Now, what I did for this talk is we separated the, um, the, the data and we looked at women specifically. And this is women who have just drunk. Um, so these are women who completed at least three of the surveys. And what we found was that increased drinking, so getting progressively um, higher rates of drinking as lockdown um, progressed, that was predicted by a few things. So planned units. So we asked people in each survey, how much do you expect to drink over the next week or two? So people who expected to drink more, drank more, which you'd expect. People who had these higher audit scores at baseline, so had more alcohol misuse problems, were drinking more, which you would expect. But interestingly, what we also found is that as, um, as lockdown were progressing, people who were using alcohol to cope and people who were feeling um, anxious were also the ones that were predicted of, uh, of drinking more. And what this model shows here is that not all those four significant predictors um, had equal strength in terms of well, how much, how strong is this predictive factor. What we found was those personal coping motives and anxiety were the really strong predictors of drinking more and more as lockdown progressed. So then what's interesting is understanding why COVID might impact women's drinking. So there are a few different things. So firstly, 
stockpiling behavior. If you have alcohol in your house, you're going to drink it. Exactly the same as if you buy chocolate or if you buy crisps or treats or anything like that, with the idea that you will save them and you will make them last for ages, doesn't really seem to be what we actually do. If it's in the house, it's gonna get drunk. Jobs and finances, so women were far more likely than men to be furloughed. Mothers were more likely than fathers to quit or to lose their job or be furloughed. And it seems to be that any recession, specifically around COVID, is gonna hit those sectors where there's often more women than men um, employed, so things like retail, hospitality. So that situation um, could be very stressful and could be driving up women's anxiety. Childcare is also really important. So um, we've known traditionally that women tend to take on more of the kind of the home production um, roles than fathers. And we also know that during lockdown, women tended to be um, providing more of the homeschooling and the care responsibilities compared to men. And that was particularly um, the case where children were younger. So here it's children aged under five, five to 10 and 11 to 15. The blue dots, the dark blue dots show the amount of um, childcare by the fathers and the green dots by women. And you can see that the discrepancy um, is much greater when the child is younger. Mental health, so there are some studies, so the UK longitudinal study um, compared uh, mental health problems in April 2019, compared those to mental health problems in April 2020 mental health problems have gone up, um, and that is greater in women. Um, alcohol Change UK, again, showed that women were much more likely to report mental health problems, low energy levels, productivity, um, and also women were more likely to link those negative effects on changes in their drinking behaviour. Um, and we also know that women were more likely than men to at least report feeling lonely and scared during COVID. So this all, again, links to this idea that coping strategies are really, really important. So we may be using alcohol to cope with these like men mental health symptoms and these negative states we might be feeling, but actually alcohol tends to make these things worse. And we also know that women are more likely than men to adopt these kind of um, quite maladaptive coping strategies and use alcohol. So in terms of the longer term implications, again, Alcohol Change UK released some interesting um, data. So 49% of the people that they are said that they expected to drink the same um, as uh, what they were drinking during lockdown. They weren't expecting that to really change as lockdown eased. 17% um, of people expected to drink more as lockdown eased. Um, those who have increased their drinking in lockdown were also less likely to say that they plan to decrease as lockdown um, eases off. That suggests that drinking habits are being formed and, and people are, the, the greater the amount that's being consumed is turning into a, a, a kind of like maybe quite a persistent drinking habit. 6% said that they have both increased their drinking during lockdown and they expect their drinking to continue to increase as lockdown um, lessens. Whereas around a third said that they are hoping to take steps to reduce their drinking as lockdown um, eases and that was especially for younger people so younger people were more likely than older people to say that they wanted to take steps to reduce their drinking now what that means is that um, there are lots of uh, theories around habit formation and there's this kind of golden magic number of 66 days 66 days is what you need to really develop a habit for it to become something that is easy to do you don't really need to think about it um, and also it can be um, quite hard to change. Obviously lockdown and COVID has gone on for longer than that. So there is this real um, concern that these more maladaptive drinking habits, these heavier drinking practices um, are gonna need us to really support people in ways to recognize that perhaps they've adopted or they've developed these new drinking habits that aren't so good for them and ways in which they might be able to um, uh, change their behaviour and reduce their drinking again. There are a few points though that should be made around any survey. So one is that people who often take part in surveys are not the ones who are at real risk of alcohol harm. So we said earlier, those people who had the higher alcohol um, use disorders to um, score were less, were more likely to be the ones who dropped out. There's a possibility that taking part in surveys actually acts as an alcohol intervention. So some of our data might 
um, implicitly show uh, a slight intervention effect, especially our survey was asking people to think about their drinking, to think about why they were drinking, think about what they planned to do with their drinking over the next couple of weeks. So there are components there that could act as an intervention. Also, we know that there are issues with um, self-reported alcohol use. So people tend to under-report their alcohol use, and that might be because people are worried about the, the consequences of reporting how much they drink, or it might genuinely be because people don't realise how much they're drinking. So we always have to take these um, factors into account. Also, in terms of the longer-term implications, we know that harm occurs at non-dependent levels. You do not have to have a severe alcohol use disorder in order to experience harm from um, drinking. And we also know that harm occurs at lower drinking levels in women. So even fairly small increases in female alcohol consumption may have potentially damaging effects, either physically or mentally, longer down the line. We also know that alcohol exacerbates existing health problems, so we need to be aware of these when we're, um, when we're kind of like looking at the, the impact of COVID on drinking and harm. The one thing I think that we really need to focus on as well is coping strategies. So there are two ways in which we might drink. One is called negative reinforcement, which is where we are motivated to drink in order to remove something negative, like stress. And then there's positive reinforcement, which is where we are we are motivated to drink to get something positive, like for partying, to socialise and to celebrate. We know that people who drink for those more negative reinforcements, those, those coping strategies are more, are more at risk of developing alcohol use problems. And again, we also know that women are certainly more likely than men to report using those negative coping um, motives for drinking. So this is something that I think we just need to be aware of and we need to come up with ways and interventions which we can engage with people, women and men, um, to support them in kind of getting back to perhaps more healthy drinking practices as lockdown eases. But great, thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions. I'm sorry if there are any questions coming through. That's great, Abby, thank you very much. Uh, I think, you know, that was fascinating. And I, I think just to sort of relate this to those who engage with club soda, bearing in mind um, it has such a strong female following. I think it's around um, two thirds of club soda participants are females. So I think, you know, what you've been talking about will, you know, resonate a lot with those who have been either trying, well, trying to renegotiate, I guess, their relationship with alcohol through the lockdown period. Um, just something I sort of wanted to touch on, because we, you very much talked about um, those who were within that sort of third of people who have increased their drinking, but there was similarly quite a sizable amount who had tried to address their drinking and reduce it. Were there any trends, and it may be outside the scope of your analysis, but were there any sort of high level trends that you noticed with that group? No, to be honest, um, we, no, we haven't. There's, I think the, the one thing that I keep coming back to is it's, it's around our mental health and our well-being. So I think when, when, more data comes in and we can look at it and also because with our survey there's only a limited amount you can do because of the attrition rate so there was a there was a real kind of um before we put the survey out we had lots of meetings around well, what can we ask we don't want the attrition rate to be awful but also the thing that we really want to get at is understanding why people are drinking and if you want to do that you have to ask the questions so there's always this push pull of you know how much can we how much evidence can we do? So we have to be very careful in terms of um, making claims around the data which might not be there in terms of who's taking part and, and who isn't. But I think as I mentioned earlier, is when our mental health is struggling, when our well-being is struggling, there are often two paths which we take. One of them is we we go towards let's have a drink and just decompress really quickly and there's the other path which is I want to have a drink but if I'm really honest with myself I know that it's probably not the best thing so actually for my own well-being right now I'm going to stop drinking and I've had lots of conversations with this with our kind of maternal drinking research and you and you see this complete divide 
that it's, it's, it's almost like I'm all in with the drinking or I'm all out with the drinking. And we see this again and again with kind of clinical mental health populations as well. So it seems to be bleeding into more general populations while COVID is going down. But in terms of what makes us take the alcohol path or the not alcohol path is a really difficult question. And we're not there yet in kind of understanding. Some of it is going to be social support. Yeah. So if you have friends who are willing to, who, if you have friends who you'll get together and say, let's all stop together, or you, if you have a partner who um, doesn't want to drink or wants to be there with you, social network is really, really key. Yeah, and I think that speaks to a lot of why um, people are increasingly turning to these sort of like supportive programs to, you know, that offer the community to support them in that path towards renegotiating their yeah. behaviours and habit forming. I think just touching upon your sort of all or nothing approach um, or the sense that people either follow the one path or the other, I think that was probably also then fueled by the stockpiling behaviour, which has sort of got it ready for you in this stash. So of course it's gonna encourage you to go down that path um, rather than choose the alternative if you've already purchased it. Yeah, I think it's really important. I also think the way in which we shop, so this is one of the reasons why we think um, traditionally with maternal drinking, traditionally there was this view that mothers don't drink because mums, you know, they can't go out. They haven't got the opportunity to drink. That just isn't the case anymore. You know, with online shopping, you just get everything delivered to you. So the alcohol is in the house. So that, that kind of like traditional kind of old fashioned view that mums don't drink is kind of, there's more and more evidence coming out now that, that you know, that's not the case. Um, and I think the same thing now, we're in lockdown, you're on the computer, you're doing your shopping, and it's just there. So well, that will be nice. And then it's in the house and it, yeah, it get and it gets drunk. And it's a bit like, you know, Christmas, you, you've got all this chocolate and at the end, you're just kind of force feeding yourself. Chocolate. You think, I just want to get rid of it. And then I can start afresh. And it's the same thing, you're stockpiling all the alcohol and it's just this, oh, let's just have another drink. So. Definitely. I had a online grocery delivery myself. It was in the, the most recent lockdown, but before Christmas and the, the delivery driver, uh, you know, thought he should do a sales pitch and tell me that if I ordered a case of at least six, I could get 25% off. <laughs> and I thought, thanks. I'm not sure that's really the message we should be sending. But, um, okay, you know, even then, you know, you, you try to resist buying or whatever, and you've got um, salespeople coming to your door in the guise of delivery drivers. Um, yeah, there's, there's always, yeah, great deals coming up. And I also find that when um, one of the things I found, again, with some of our qualitative research, so we're asking women about kind of like, why do you feel why you're not drinking? One thing that also keeps coming up at the moment is, I just want one less thing to decide. And so again, it, we're not talking about women um, or men who have an, a, like a traditional what you call an alcohol problem you know they're not people who are binge drinking and having accidents and blacking out or anything like that just people who are in this the same day is the same again and again and again and it's something you know you can see alcohol as something to look forward to we find it a lot with mum saying it's my switch it's the thing that at the end of the day when I manage to get the kids to bed, it's that thing that now it's my time, it's my reward. And you can get into that habit. And I know but some people I found during lockdown said, I'm, I've got so many decisions to make all the time, homeschooling, working, doing this, doing that. I actually got to the point where I couldn't be bothered to go through that decision-making process about having another drink or, or should I have, should this be a drinking day or should it not be a drinking day? Mm -hmm. And I say, actually, they just found it easy. said, you know what, I'm just going to stop. Well, I think, well, I think sorry, I'm sorry. getting a bit of feedback there, but I think that our ability to resist weakens throughout the day, right? So when we think of, um, or I think that's why we tend to make worse decisions the later in the day because we're more tired. Um, I'm just sort of looking at some questions that are coming through. Um, Claire, not me, another Claire, thank you for your question, um, is sort of talking about the sort of, I guess, the predominance of women within the sobriety space, both writers um, and influencers, if we want to call them that, or just sort of um, 
people who are looking to help others and you know I guess she's asking why why do we think sort of women are at the forefront of that but I guess how will the research that you're sort of talking about and the increase in drinking is do you think it will increase in the likelihood of people um, turning to non-traditional support systems or seeking help in other ways yeah i i yeah i i do thank you for that question i think that i think there is a there's a there's a gendered issue around seeking help women talk more traditionally and i know it all sounds like stereotypes but it's women tend to be more open about issues they tend to talk about things more as i said women are much more open about the fact that they will use alcohol to, to cope um, and women tend to also be more likely to admit that maybe their drinking has got out of hand um, it's much harder to get men to talk about their their alcohol use behavior and we find this time and time again in research it's it's um it's not a reason why i went into women and alcohol research but actually I'm quite pleased I do because I know people who work more and they focus on men's drinking and paternal drinking and it's a real struggle to actually try and get men to engage in that research and that process and saying actually do you need some help um, I also think that yes there will be it wouldn't surprise me at all if there was more of a shift towards looking for support in um, other areas so not going down that traditional route of clinical because actually uh, and again, we get this all the time with mums who will say that they are drinking too much, but they absolutely do not want to get help through going to their GP um, for lots of reasons, partly because of the stigma attached to it and they're worried about what might be the consequences of saying, actually, I think I might need some help in my drinking. But also a lot of people quite understandably say, well, I drink a bit too much, but it's not, you know, it's not a problem. I'm not, you know, I'm still doing everything I need to do. I'm holding down a job or, um, you know, I'm, I'm really successful at being um, a, a woman who has chosen to stay at home and look after her children. I'm doing everything and I'm, you know, I'm succeeding even though I might be, you know, exhausted and, and things like that. So actually they don't feel as if the clinical route is the way to go for them. It's not going to be the most effective. It's not going to be appropriate for them. So yeah, I think, and I think more and more, and again, there's a difference between men and women. Women are much more likely to go online for support than men are. Women use social media and online information services to get support for their health and their drinking behaviour much more than men do. Yeah, and I think some of the latest research about dry January, and I know you talked about alcohol change in your presentation, mm -hmm. you know, some of the research about perhaps last year's dry January was, you know, it was 66% or staggering amounts of uh, women, female participants compared to men. Um, and actually, similar to your um, data demographic, they were women who were educated to degree level or of higher socioeconomic um sort of status levels and so perhaps it does suggest it you know in answer to claire's question that it something about uh, maybe the focus on well-being and um independently working through some of those habit formation issues it is more attractive to women um than to men and i think it's probably bizarrely actually that's probably plays more into my upcoming research about women's experiences with non-traditional treatment paths so you know catch me in three years time when yeah I'm well yeah no it'll be good. but i think the other thing that's really important about that is uh, i think there is a there is a concern that because we keep saying the same kind of demographics engaging these sorts of interventions there's a real um, worry that we are missing women from other um, demographics that actually need help. So, so it tends to be women from more or more privileged areas that engage with these sorts of things. Where actually, harm, alcohol harm, is disproportionately um, evidenced in more deprived regions. So we've got to make sure that when we were thinking about developing new interventions and, and making sure that we're, we're genuinely reducing alcohol harm, we've got to make sure that we're engaging with women and men from more deprived areas, that we are developing interventions that actually are meaningful and useful for those people as well. And part of that, though, 
is to get in contact with them, is to somehow get them to be aware of this is something that's there and this is something that we can help you with. Um, it is challenging. It is when you think of a lot of the discourse around it about well-being and self-care is very, you know, middle class or class focused. It's also very culturally focused, you know perhaps exercise is not as popular or um you know easily available for women of different faiths or cultural you know um cultural groups so what we would uh, offer as alternative coping mechanisms or part of that reconceptualization of habits um is not as accessible to you know those who are not of white middle class, you know, high socioeconomic groups, which seems to be what um, who is attracted to the likes of Dry January and so on. I'm just looking through more questions from people. I mean, there's been so many people coming forward um, on the chat to say, like Emma um, and Ali, who have sort of been talking about how they're um, this has been really helpful and they're sort of doing Emma's at 28 days alcohol free. Um, well so am I actually. I, d I decided oh. for the first time ever to do dry January and it was partly just because I, I was fed up with it um, and yeah it's been all right. Well done. It was my birthday a few days ago and I think oh, it was happy the birthday as well. The well no I'm only saying because I'm saying, it was probably the, apart from when I was pregnant it was kind of like the only birthday that I've had yeah without any alcohol I, I use I, I got a, a like a no alcohol bottle of um you know Prosecco it was great it was it was lovely actually and, it, and it, it does it becomes it's a bit like when you find out you're pregnant and you give up in the first few weeks I, I remember thinking oh it'll be really weird not you know not drinking for you know eight and a half months sort of thing or you know whatever it was and then actually after a few weeks you kind of forget about it for the first few weeks it's it's kind of like it's all you think about and then it just gets easier and easier. Mm, yeah, I think definitely as time goes on, when you find other ways of, of yeah. celebrating or coping. Um, I'm just looking at Ali's question. He's sort of talking about how um, many people were poo-pooing the idea of even like a temporary abstinence, saying how else are they going to get through lockdown or homeschooling life? You know, how do we think um, drinking habits in lockdown is going to affect the 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 dominant narrative of alcohol is awesome you know that might be a question I'm not sure that's quite a big question for you but um I don't I don't know how it's gonna I don't know how it's gonna change the narrative I do think that as with everything it's dividing people so because of what I do I'm, I'm often on social media and I'm, I think because of my search history I'm always being bombarded with alcohol messages hopefully more than other people are um, and I've noticed there's, again, there's this real, there are these two camps where, yeah, alcohol is absolutely fine. And then alcohol, no, it's, it's a no-no. So I'm, I'm on a group of house, you know, house found with kids or try, like trying to be supportive of homeschooling and things. And just today, there was, there was a lovely post by somebody, you know, who'd done this like poem about how tough it is. But then their comment was, and yes, Prosecco on a Wednesday is a good idea. And I knew that it was a really, it was, it was, you know, it was from a good place. It was saying, whatever you need to do, it's okay. You know, give yourself some slack. And I didn't reply, I didn't say anything, but all I wanted to say was, you can take care of yourself in a way that isn't by drinking. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's hard. Yeah, and you know, where do you draw the line between being that person that... I know, I can't, I, can't, yeah. I have to like, turn everything off, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not replying. <laughs> Um, I just saw a fantastic question. Here we go. Um, from Lizzie. Marketing. Marketing is playing a massive part in the influence of alcohol use. And obviously, um, Abby, you touched upon this earlier. Uh, how do you think this can be changed? Um, is obviously, outside of the scope of your survey, but I know that there's a lot of thoughts, especially around sort of like the no and low drinks and the marketing of those. You know, are you seeing anything sort of coming through that's interesting? We haven't we haven't done anything um, specifically at the moment. So I um, I work I one of the um, the new 
PhD students that's starting. Um, one of the supervisors is going to be a woman called Amanda Atkinson. She's based at Liverpool John Moores University. If you're interested in this gendered marketing research, she's amazing. Um, and her focus is on how the um, alcohol industry really targets women, whether that be explicitly or implicitly, um, and how that might um, how we can challenge that. So one of the things I mentioned is that there is sometimes a real backlash on female um, focused alcohol marketing, but it tends to be, even though on social media you often see um, social groups and women sharing you know, those memes, you know, that they're everywhere about how mothers and women need to drink, that seemed to be acceptable. And I kind of wonder whether the alcohol industry saw that go, okay, so this is the thing, women are drinking because they're all stressed and things, so let's target that, so let's, you know, make this brand of mad housewife wine, and, you know, there's chick beer, um, and there's the skinny girl, yeah, all, all this kind of thing, but actually the ones that really focused mothers, really tried to get mothers, had a huge backlash, and there were so many complaints um, from lots of different groups, but also just you know from you know, everyday people, um, and yeah, they were they were taken off the shelf. So there 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 are there are ways you can do it because the alcohol industry basically they want to follow trends. They don't they they're not interested in necessarily um, kind of changing one. They just want to ride whatever is going to help them. Um, so it's it's always going to be very difficult. There's always going to be a market for for I think gendered alcohol marketing. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think it's more effective if it's more subtle rather than in your face. And then it starts to get people's sort of more conscious brains sort of questioning the purchase and the behaviour. Um, a question here from Emma. Do you think alcohol will ever be thought of as how we now think of smoking? Um, um, I think things are changing definitely around alcohol so with 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 this increase in lower alcohol products and no alcohol products and things so there is a growing market so people will start to use those products more whether they um use them more and reduce their alcohol intake is is another matter um there is some there there's data coming out to show that younger people are drinking less um, that's not to say that there isn't still a drink problem in younger people there seems to be a a smaller um, population of younger people who drink very dangerously and are at real risk of harm. But as a general trend, we're seeing a decrease in alcohol use. The reasons why that we're not quite sure. We think it might be the way people interact and in social media and things. And also, um, so we do some research on this with student populations and they talk about the fact that um, everything they do is recorded. So everything that happens on a night out, there are photos on Instagram, you know, everywhere. And they don't want to be embarrassed by it. And they don't want the, the kickback from them. So there are, I think there are cultural shifts happening, but I think we still have a very long way to go. And I think as well, there is a unique thing about alcohol in the UK that it's there to socialise and to bring people together, more so than smoking ever really was. So I, I, I'm not entirely sure that it, would, it will follow exactly the same pattern. But just sorry, and I know we're coming up to time, but um, do you think this is in terms of young people? Are we talking about those over 18 or have you seen any specific trends about underage drinkers? Because there's recent survey after the millennium suggesting that that was decreasing. Yeah, so there is some research that suggests that underage drinking is also going down. Um, but again, there is a there is a population, there's always a subpopulation which are at um, you know, up very high risk levels, but there, there does seem to be a general trend. It's always really difficult with younger people because again, you have a lot of issues around how they're reporting their drinking behavior, whether they will be reporting it honestly or not. And it could be that they're reporting it, they're saying that they're drinking more than they actually are. Um, but yeah, there, there does seem to be um, a decrease. and. Everything goes up and down. If you look over, you know, different periods of history, alcohol use goes up and down. It fluctuates and things. So that's why it's important to make sure you're seeing a trend year on year on year to see that it's a it's a, it's a real kind of decrease. And then understanding what's happening. We had some really um, some colleagues and friends of mine, Susie Gage and um, 
Pravitha Patlay brought out a really interesting paper. It was last year, but it was focused on adolescent mental health, so young people's mental health. And they compared two birth cohorts, one from, I think it was the 80s, and, and the millennium cohort, sorry, so people born in the year 2000. And they showed that mental health problems were were higher, significantly higher in the millennium cohort, so teenagers, you know, teenagers in like 2014 and 2015. But things that we traditionally associate with those higher mental health problems, such as alcohol and substance use, were lower in this cohort. So that traditional relationship we see between mental health and alcohol use also might be changing. It's not gone, mm -hmm. but things are changing. Yeah, so it's yeah, so clearly, clearly other factors at play. Mm -hmm. right? Um, okay, I'm conscious that it's uh, come up to one o'clock. You've got places to be. Um, just, you know, thank you so much to everybody who's submitted a lot of comments. I know on Facebook and YouTube, there's some coming in, especially about all of your sort of sobriety achievements, particularly within the last month and beyond. So well done. Um, thank you to Club Soda for hosting uh, the webinar today. And thank you to Dr. Abby Rose for delivering such a fantastic presentation. I think it's all given us a lot to think about. And hopefully we can sort of dig down into some of those other issues in subsequent webinars. So thank thanks very much. much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks.